Hi, everyone. Start it shortly. Hi everyone, we'll get started in a few minutes. 10.50 will kick off, uh, depending on how many people will join by that. Uh, there's still a few to go, I guess. Speak in a bit. Okay, hi everyone. Just at 50. So let's share my screen and we can start off this workshop. Okay, perfect. It works fine. Perfect. Hi, everyone. Let's start off this workshop. Um, today, I will um, talk to you about legacy of modernization via API and how to benefit from that using an API management platform. Right. My name is Mike Anna. I'm a customer engineer at Google Cloud, focusing on uh, API management and related solutions. And thanks, everyone, who joined for the workshop today. We have 50 minutes, and this is the agenda. We'll have a look at an intro into the relevance of APIs in modernization initiatives. Then we'll have a look into AP, Apigee API management, what are its capabilities, just shortly, and how we see uh, our customers use the platform for modernizing uh, existing architectures. And then we'll look into a hands-on. So uh, as shown in my screen, I'll go into a demo, and I'll guide you through a journey of going from a, an existing, more legacy service into modern API and how this can be used by a variety of, um, of consumers. And then for the remainder, we'll have Q&A. Perfect. So let's start off. Why APIs? Um, and, and why are they so important when modernizing your services? So by now, we all know that an API uh, is an interface that one program talk to another. 
as an example, uh, look at the application that you have by multi Each of these systems has a set of services that allow uh, external programs to communicate with them. Therefore, API power experiences. Number two, uh, a good set of APIs also allow you to quickly build new experiences, leveraging reusability and consistency of an existing API catalog. Uh, as such, APIs let you build new experiences quickly, for example, using voice assistants or similar to build new experience, new capabilities for your consumers. And last but not least, APIs let you respond to the market quickly, whether it's using machine learning to provide new recommendations or recommended insurance products, or the need to reduce the cost of service calls, customer uh, call center service calls, or simply to supply data to new partners inside or outside your industry. Those are business requirements which are accelerated through APIs um, being available as building blocks. But if you look into net new greenfield services and more brownfield existing services, there are challenges with those, right? There's business continuity. How do you decompose the monolithic applications into microservices without disrupting the existing clients and apps that use them? How do you make sure that the, the new microservices that you build are actually reused in your organization and have, are, 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 have, have dedicated ownership like product owners? Right. How do you make sure that these systems in the next state are not tightly coupled anymore? And also, very important, the systems that you may now have in place at this time, uh, the core banking systems, for example, they don't fit the latest and current security standards. We have the context of the end user, of the app developer. We, you know, we use standards like OAuth and um, the context of, of three different uh, actors in engaging there to provide a security context. That all needs to be still done for existing services in many cases, because that's simply not there yet. Interoperability, right? With no interface standards in place, it's always repeated efforts to build integrations and visibility, last but not least. You want to make sure that whatever you do on existing and new services, you have the insights into who's using your APIs at what time, where's the peak, and how is it trending? So looking into Apigee API management, a full lifecycle API management platform, we'll have a look at what we have seen at our customers in the previous years and the pattern, specifically when we talk about modernizing services. So the major theme that we are seeing in the banking world is that we are seeing banks break down the monolithic core banking systems into microservices, migrating them to the cloud and so-called API enabling or APIing them so that richer channel applications can be built. Right? Whether that's for the call center, a new online web channel, mobile, or branches. All of, for all of these, modern APIs are required. Also, these services, these APIs, can then be easily externalized for regulatory reasons, PSD2, or to drive innovation by providing fintech access to the services and data that they need or want. So Apigee API management, as you see in this graphic, allows you to rationalize your IT infrastructure while maintaining business continuity. As such, API essentially become the enabler for all new products being built moving forward. So app modernization, in essence, is the effort to move away from monolithic and rigid systems. And monolithic decomposition and migration journeys, API management provides the right level of visibility to access the criticality of certain legacy systems. And they also it also helps to set migration strategies because you know the criticality of services and you know when are they used and by what partners or internal teams. So in essence, whether you have middleware, SOA, legacy systems, call banking, by decomposing them into new architecture and microservices, putting an API management layer at the top helps you to hide the complexity and also 
uh, help to remove the, the business disruption that my face typically it's not a month it's not maybe even one year it's uh, these things span multiple years and uh, you know some of you who listen to this are, are, are surely in one, in one of that certain in one of these phases in modernizing some services so really in a nutshell Apigee provides a consistent well-designed set of interfaces then to outside service consumers whether that's internal teams or external partners, fintechs, et cetera, they can then access APIs in a standardized way through the platform and you get all the visibility and control over who you want to share these APIs with. Some examples of capabilities here is controlling access to individual services, uh, being able to intelligently route traffic, uh, rate limit traffic in case you expect some uh, peaks, peaks and spikes and know that the backend is not able to handle it. You can add catting to further improve the response time, and you can do the classic things such as managing keys and credentials to your APIs, managing versions, and using a dev portal to host documentation and onboard users. Last but not least, something that's available as well is monetization capabilities. So if you would like to directly monetize the data, uh, the, data uh, the access to your data or certain capabilities by a per paper use, or in a revenue share model. An example of a customer using Apigee for app modernization and the results is Nationwide, one of the uh, Fortune 100 US FS organizations. They uh, offer various types of insurances. So their challenge was how to provide the right data in the ad uh, and quickly deliver a new uh, mobile application, reducing the time it takes to onboard new partners to get access to their data and before using Apigee API management, each new service needed to at least integrate with six legacy systems to get to a place where the API was in a state to be consumed. So essentially, they've used Apigee as a modernization facade, so modernizing in place and being able to hide the complexity of legacy backends and bring them on par with the new services, the new APIs that have been built in a cloud-native fashion. Also, they not only looked at the API management runtime, the gateway and security aspect, they also implemented self-service for partner developers through a developer portal so they could easily onboard and the API team would quickly see where the interest comes from and what part would like to get on board and make use of the APIs. So results, Development time reduced uh, from two months to several days. Um, in, in essence, also by being agile and providing new services quickly in, into the web experience, interest in certain insurances went up and also the complexity went down because we, we went from, let's say, complex SOAP systems to something that's easily consumed by a REST API. All right, so now, uh, after a bit of theory and a bit of background on uh, where, where we, how we now today at this session look at API management, we'll look at the four stages of service modernization. So throughout many modernization journeys with our customers, uh, we have distilled all their activities that we did with them into four distinct patterns they use Apigee for. Right? So they also reflect the stages which organizations find themselves in when modernizing their app architecture in general, including but not limited to on-prem to cloud migration. During the keynote, uh, if you have seen that, Simon touched upon the two streams required uh, to be able to build an ecosystem. It's optimizing the core and fast track the future. Optimizing or revitalizing the core is about edification, data, and automation. And here at this workshop, Apigee, as an API management platform is the key component we'll look at for edification of existing applications. So to look at this uh, with the today's example of today's workshop, we're leaning on what Simon touched upon in the opening keynote. The example capability we're looking into is lending. I'll take you on a journey showing you how to move from an internal lending system, easily modernizing it for a call center, but then Opening it, opening it up for new merchant partnerships 
transforming this lending service into uh, into a pay later a that we'll look into. So four stages. We first of all have an existing service and provide the lending capability. We then want to easily migrate our systems and have uh, have the power to control wh who, what, uh, what consumers we introduce the new API first. We then have a look into operating in, in a hybrid world where we really have um, both. We have microservices, uh, existing applications, etc. We'll have a look how to harmonize and standardize via uh, a, a central uh, security integration, so one single identity, as well as the ability to onboard new partners and provide an easy onboarding experience. And we end up with also talking about how you can use and why a management is also relevant when we look at the more cloud native approach and managing purely microservices. All right. So let's have a look here. Uh, let's have a look at the components. So an architecture diagram that I've um, that, that I've drawn up here. So first step is we have an existing loan offer capability. Let's use it. Right, as simple as that. So those here, we start off with this diagram. So I'll put Apogee in the middle, in between our existing loan service and the call center that now want to use the the API. So instead of handing them directly the the API from from the call system, which may be a pretty comprehensive SOAP API returning multiple fields, which really are not important to handle or give loan offerings initially through a call center, we want to modernize this in place. So for that, we're building a loans API in its first iteration, and you already see that we're transforming an XML SOAP message into a REST API. Also, we'll see that in the blue box where we, where we have API management, we currently will focus on the runtime, and we'll look at, later aspect, at other aspects a bit later on as well. All right, so let's start. So first and foremost, what I'm going to do is I'm going to to the Apigee UI. So building our loans API. So first and foremost, just you know to make it really simple, I have here my lending service. Uh, sample legacy backend. So as you see here, this is a post call uh, with some basic authorization uh, with basic auth headers. Sending the request returns a SOAP message uh, with a couple of setups of you know, what are the charges and fees. So details about a loan offer coming from our legacy backend. So now what do we do with it? First step is we use Apigee to build an API proxy. API proxy is the facade sitting on top of a backend API, and we'll have a look what you can do within that proxy framework. So here within API proxies, we already have a couple of them listed, but let's quickly go through the creation of one just to see, just to show you what's possible. All right, so we just type in reverse proxy. Let's say we have this as a V0. We give it a base path for our external users of the call center. Uh, front-end development team. And here, we include the target. So this could be, for example, this endpoint, just to point to the to the SOAP backend. Uh, we can already include some common policies here if we would like to, for example, API key, adding course headers. We then select where we want to run this uh, API, uh, because in this case, I run G as a managed service. There are virtual hosts pre-assigned, which you can easily convert into your own domains, so api.company.com. Simply said, I want to expose it on my secure port. And last but not least, I select the environment tests. Now I create and deploy this so-called proxy. And once that's available, uh, we'll see that the URL now pointing, which I would share with the contact center team, is going. If you go into edit proxy, We'll see a quick overview of what we have. At the bottom, you see we're pointing to the uh, SOAP system here. We have a base path slash launch slash v0. And this is the front end or northbound URL that sits now on Apigee and which is the target URL 
for anyone consuming this API. Within deployment, we see we have it deployed to test with a with a green light here. Operations are, can be controlled by API, and you definitely see in production, we you know my promotion to production is done through CI/CD. Now, before I go into the actual version of, of the API that I've built before this, I'll quickly explain what we have here in terms of the UI. So this is the proxy flow window. It's really the development environment. So at the middle, you see two flows, two arrows, request and response. Essentially, if you would like to enforce policies on uh, hitting Apigee and before Apigee passes it on to the back end, we throw these policies in at the top. If you would like to do a validation of, of, of the response payload that Apigee received from the back end, you can put these in below. As an example, verify API key policy definitely comes here at the re re request flow, whereas the course header definitely comes in at the response flow here because we would like to add uh, our course headers for browser traffic uh, after we've received the response from the backend, not before. So we see, based on the wizard, a couple of policies have already been added. Uh, we, however, add way more to them. So simply by adding a new step here, I can now start to look at um, enforcing a quota or enforcing a spike arrest. And how to configure these individual policies, we have our config here below, where we can easily change some of the uh, some of the attributes. So spike arrest, we want to enforce that uh, firsthand when the request enters Apigee, and we would like to have it off for 10 per second. So across uh, the whole multi-tenant architecture, it looks at um, denying requests after 10 per second, 10 requests per second. So that's a short example into how to quickly build a proxy with an Apigee. Now, generic, generically, how to add policies to it. But now, we'll go into the loan API, into the V1 that I've built, and see what's there to, in real life, connect to the backend uh, and, and expose the API and transform it into a modern REST endpoint. All right, so I'll just save this here. Just and we're now go into we're now going into our loans v1 proxy. So as you remember, if you as you remember, uh, yeah. With the postman here, I and I get a response um, based on an amount, upfront payment, a couple of descriptions of what the, what 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 that loan is for, and a response. Now here. Let's have a look into our first iteration of this proxy, sending it to the backend that you see here, so loans. Now let's cover what we have there, bare minimum, to modernize this, this service into a REST API. All right, so we first of all have a verify API key policy, clear. As simple as that, for, for the four internal teams, uh, if, if we look into internal traffic within the organization, within the corporate network, verifying an API key can be enough, uh, but it can be added, obviously, with other tokens or an OAuth and JOT as well. So we have that as our first entry point. Now, we have a couple of other policies that you see here as well. And uh, one of those is actually more on the target endpoint side. And we, we see them pop up here. So what do we need to do to connect to this API? Um, we have here our key value map operation. So we fetch the username and the password from our key value map, which can be encrypted within Apigee. Because we have our username and password stored, uh, and they won't, uh, they won't change anytime soon. But we can change if we want to. But because we now provide API key towards our clients and consumers, we don't need that user name password authentication anymore. So we simply retrieve that from our, uh, from our encrypted store, and we use our policy to uh, add a basic authentication header onto the request 
towards the backend API. So we, we hide uh, for, for, for consumers, we now completely hide that there is any sort of basic auth required because we don't show. All right, and afterwards, the response, essentially this XML doc, doc uh, this XML response. What we do is three operations. We use an XSL, uh, we use an X, our XSL policy to remove the SOAP envelope because we don't want the SOAP body, SOAP envelope, etc. all these uh, different uh, sort of tags there. We remove them through a XSL, uh, uh, an XSL document that is tagged here. So just quickly this one, you can quickly find how to do that uh, to just remove uh, the, the, the irrelevant bits of the response. And then I add it onto into a new message. I have a new, now a new variable called shortened response. That's now the new XML uh, payload. And I'll take that to transform this XML to JSON. And that's it. Right. Within Apigee, you can quickly see what's going on and whether the policies that you've implemented actually work and why not if they don't. For that, we can use the trace on the right. So I'll go over into the trace tab now and I'll start it. And now I have another Postman call. So instead of hitting the SOAP directly, I am now hitting v one with an API key. Let's send that request. And now we see we get a similar response, but now in JSON format, something, you know, Readable more easy, more easily, and a couple of additional information here. Cool. So as we go through our um, through our trace, we see that the API key has been validated successfully. The credentials have been retrieved, and we've added this to the basic auth header, which means that sending this now to the backend would be a curl as follows. The factory sign means we fit the backend, and we now have a response. As you see, if I scroll down into some of the variables that are available at runtime, we see that this is the payload returned. And now we step through the individual uh, operations. So here, if we look into the uh, shortened response variable, we see already that the, the um, so header, et cetera, are, are removed. We're now adding this as a generating a new message from it and converting this to JSON. And as such, we now have a new payload returned without having to touch the backend, but still modernized. So that's the response we've seen in Postman being, uh, being available here. All right, so that's our first step. We have our API, and as an example, We've modernized it for our call center and provided a, a means of, uh, of API key verification to the internal team that now makes use of the first version of our loan capability uh, via Apigee. All right. Now, second, it'll look that's that's going to be interesting because now we have a use case that we improved the service through cloud native implementation moving forward. So in a scenario where we took the monolithic application and we, we built uh, a microservice for this local capability now after some time, but we already have the call center using it heavily. We might already have other clients using it. So we have a dependency and we can cause business disruption if we fiddle around with it. So we want to gradually migrate and because we have dependencies, we will use Apigee to uh, intelligently route to individual backends. So that's a that's a scenario in step number two, and that's what I'll add. That's what I'll scribble on top of the architecture. So now there is a mobile app, for example, that needs to use this as well. And for that, they've built a new microservice, but it is still the loans API in version one. Now, as you see here on the the red arrows at the bottom. We are now pointing to two backends. And we, as an example, want to gradually migrate over from lo loan service uh, legacy over into our loan API microservices, which reside in a cloud. So how do we go about that? Let's switch to our 
proxy into the UI. All right, so we have our loan to be one. That is still the version one for our consumers. We don't want to change this because functionality-wise, nothing. So there is no there is no need in incrementing this. We'll go back into our develop tab, and if we look closely into the configurations here, we see that there is a revision three. Besides having besides versions of an API itself of a backend API, you can also have revision of individual proxies. Um, this is you know a configuration of individual policies. You can even add your own JavaScript code as part of a JavaScript policy. So. Individual revisions of proxies can also have their own CI CD cycle and, and, and life cycle and pipeline. So, what I did within a couple of minutes of, of effort is that I've now looked into, I've, I've built a couple of new revisions and I've ended up in a revision seven that I think is now serving both of my backends. So, I want to call out. The fact that at the bottom left, at target endpoints, we currently have our so-called legacy system. So this is pointing to this lending service here. All right. Now let's move over to revision seven. As you see, a couple of additional policies here, but nothing, nothing extreme. Uh, and note at the bottom, we now have two target endpoints: legacy and pay later on cloud. Right. So we're using a capability that someone called pay later. Uh, it's a set of microservices. We want to leverage this uh, the loan capability from within the service uh, to make use within as uh, part of this proxy. So how do we go about it? So what we what we can do within Apigee is we can do conditional routing, and we can we can uh, depending on the context of the client, we can send the response to either one or the other backend. And also have a wait and gradual migration to seamlessly and gradually migrate over to the new system. You also don't necessarily want to do a big bang migration for some capabilities because you still want to test whether the new API can handle it and whether the error rate is uh, consistent or low, similarly low to what you have already there. So I'll show you the changes now and. Uh, what I'll do first of all as well is I'm now deploying this number seven revision to test. So what it's doing in the background as part of our managed runtime, it's undeploying revision three and it's deploying revision uh, seven in a uh, zero downtime fashion. So now we have number seven deployed to our test environment. So what I want to touch upon is essentially that um, depending on uh, depending on a configuration which we'll see in a bit, we route to either one backend or the other. And for that, we have a so-called route rule. So we see two backends, legacy and pay later, as we see it's calling something appspot.com already. So how do we decide when to use what? So for that, um, for that let me show you the flow in more detail and let me go over the following highlighted in blue so so-called route rules allow you to define where uh, when to route where essentially most importantly here we simply set a condition that or that condition very checks whether a specific attribute that i've defined uh, as part of the product we'll have a look at that in a bit equals internal. So whenever the audience of this API is internal, I route to my legacy backend. Otherwise, I route to the default now, which is the new microservice. So we already have two backends. You can have multiple. And these conditions can be also slightly more complex than this simple configuration. Right. So that's our setup on proxy level. Um, we can hit a, we can Hit a trace again to see now on revision seven how things work, um, and we now have you know number now call three to migrate here. So this is now again this the same API call now to a new revision, 
and nothing changed much here. We still verify the key. Uh, we get the credentials, all good. And uh, what we see here is that send it this, right? Now I, ha I have this API key starting mid day, and I'm hitting my legacy system. Now there is a different API call with a different API key ending on ng, and I'll send that quickly through. And what we'll see is that even though it's the same API call, looking here, we're now hitting the new microservice. So how, how did we achieve that? We achieved that by using Apigee's product concept. So on top of proxies, which you've seen is the wrapper around uh, your backend APIs, we, we are building API products to uh, to further abstract the concept of this API and what's possible. So we have now a loans API v1 product defined. That product uses one proxy. It can have multiple two. So this loans API has a attribute called consumer audience. And that audience for the product has been flagged as internal. We already see that I've pre-built or someone built an application called Contact Center, which has a valid API key. It's using uh, it can use this API product. Okay. But how do we how do we make sure that other clients will will hit uh, will hit will hit a different API? So for that, you simply build a different API product. So now we have a loans API. Let's say for B two B partners, with the same configuration of API resources just that the consumer audience now has been set to be to be partners. So configurational API product level ultimately translates to uh, rich routing and conditional capabilities on the proxy runtime. So products on top with different API keys assigned, depending on who you share this product with and what API key they receive, allow you to do conditional routing on the proxy and allow you to seamlessly then migrate uh, over from one system to another without impacting the clients and without even having them having to know about this, of course. Now, I'm simply running a bit of traffic. And uh, essentially, what you want to do as part of the migration, just going back to, to this illustration here, we are gradually migrating. So we want to see how the new API is performing versus the existing API. For that, we can use uh, analytics. There are rich analytics available within Apigee already by default. For example, we can have a look at the overall traffic composition of all our APIs and, and who's using them and to what extent. So for example, top 10 apps. The top 10 apps are here, loan options from a partner, the contact center, and then some sort of web app, et cetera. So these are pre-built the reports because by default, Apigee is, is, is logging some metadata of, of, of the API traffic, specifically who's using the API based on the key and the, and, and the, and the traffic stats in general. Now, for this migration, however, I specifically need a report that shows me how these two uh, systems of loans of the loans API compare. So for that, I've quickly built a custom report. This one here, migration stats. Creating this is super easy. Uh, we create, we add our metrics and our dimensions, and that's it. Right? Nothing else to it. I've pre-built that to save a bit of. Let's have a look at this report, and let's have a look at the interesting bits of our migration. All right, so we have now uh, today, let's have a look at the last seven days, for example, and we'll drill down into the loans v1 proxy. We'll see, as we defined in the report settings, that if we get to the loan, we look at in individual revisions. As we know already by now, revision three was just hitting our backend, uh, just hitting one endpoint. Endpoint number seven is more interesting though, as we see 100,000 calls. Now, we'll go into proxy revision number seven. And this is where, in, again, by default with an average, we can go down into where, uh, where the 
the proxy routes the requests to. So we see here 53,000 uh, or API calls go to the new service compared to 46,000 on legacy, right? To have a look, however, so we can go into and GPS compared to it. As we see, um, the new service introduces 200 milliseconds, where the existing has 22 milliseconds. Well, as a product owner of this API, that will be something to worry about because I uh, optimally would at least go, would like to go under 100 milliseconds or get at least close to what I had at the back end. Right? So now we see here already that uh, as part of this migration stage, I don't necessarily want to move everything over to the new service because I want to tweak it first. And also, if you look into the traffic itself, how much did they get uh, on average? And we see it's pretty constantly uh, three TPS and two and a half TPS for this one. So, uh, and, uh, and below we see a summary. So we can we can go into uh, there are, you know more details around the dispersion uh, for each etc. And um, it will be definitely also more interesting to see the different clients that use these APIs uh, in you know in a scenario where you have dozens of consumers using this API. But these stats, this API platform, you know, helps you to get information about the migration that always is not uh, it's it's not only a one off and turning a switch from one side to the other. Sometimes you need to take care of your APIs, especially when there are dependencies. And these reports uh, can help you with that. All right. So that's stage number two. We've migrated. We got insights from our migration, and we have we now we are now armed well to go and migrate fully of our legacy application. So we end up in some of the you know more complex environments. So we have. A variety of APIs available, different authentication standards and message formats. We need some consolidation, and you need to some standardization, right? We have API evangelists already uh, uh, sharing API standards, REST, GraphQL standards, etc., to make sure that APIs are consistent. But typically, one of the pain points still is that there is that there are different authentication standards out there, um, different types of identity systems, not only one. So typically, we see one project that uh, is one of the first when it comes to modernizing and harmonizing APIs is looking at a single identity endpoint. And also, as a second step, how teams can then start to use this API without having to go through a Slack, channel, email, PDFs, etc. And that's step number three. Also, um, you know, we'll we'll go a bit of a you know quickly walking time into the future, because as we've heard already today, um, you know, lending uh, APIs is something that becomes very important, very important moving forward. And one of those APIs or capabilities that have been called out uh, earlier today is so is pay later. And for that, we can look. At, uh, building a pay later API that incorporates the loan capability that we already have. But um, if you remember, obviously, this is now with regards to merchants using a uh, pay later API to get loan offerings. But this merchant works together or uh, interacts with end consumers. So you now actually have the end consumer context that wasn't there before. So this is now a shift from a loan API into the pay later API, but uh, I'll quickly cover. So this is the pay later API, one uh, spec that has been designed by Swift with regards to how uh, the, the lending capability via APIs can look like. So in a scenario uh, where we now want to embark on this journey, we can embed the existing lending capability into this API, but we need to add consent management and the end user context to this API, right? So a bit of you know, iterations go into it, and that API is ready. So we're now at a stage where this API is ready to be used. Um, if we look into our spec within Apigee, then our open API spec for, uh, for the pay later API 
the couple of uh, slight changes is available here as well, as you see. So uh, uh, we see here the consumer consent endpoint, loan offers, loan payment, and status of this payment. Those are a couple of you know core capabilities of of. All right. So now what we want to do is look at identity. How do we now get from plain very API key verification, which to be honest is not a security as such, onto uh, a standardized security? Again, uh, with with our with many of our interactions with customers, we see that another pattern that is becoming more and more prevalent is integration with an existing identity provider. So. Uh, in this scenario, and you might have that uh, surely as well, you have an existing uh, identity provider like an Okta, uh, Ping, et cetera. Now, we have our authorization domain here. Uh, we have users or applications being managed from, uh, from, from Okta, from the external IDP. So how do we integrate it with Apigee easily? Let's have a look. Let's have a look how this can be done. Uh, within our proxies. So from our specs, we go back to our proxy and we now find the PayLater API. So we've got the PayLater API and you'll see it is actually even easier um, to, to, to add some policies in uh, because we don't have to do any translations anymore. So we can, uh, we have three of these buckets here, right? See three of these um, policies. So one is called race course, meaning something to do with uh, course uh, handling of headers. Then a generic threat protection, and last but not least, authorization. So that looks like something we want to look into now, because we look at identity. So in this case, uh, these blue boxes here actually are a so-called uh, call out to an existing flow. Right? We call this a shared flow because within the organization, you will have certain functionality that you don't want to be repeated over and over again per API. And this is where our shared flows come into play. So we now go into the shared flow section and we'll have a look at this auth v2. That's it. Again, the very same proxy editor, but this time just one direction of the flow. We have a couple of uh, things here, but um, think, uh, you know, the, from, from these six, we simply look up in cache whether we have um, the job keys already, we don't. We simply do a service call out to our identity, uh, identity provider. As you see, um, it's nothing else than getting this, this list of keys to validate the job token. We then extract this. Uh, take the JSON path and extract this into a variable, and we store it into cache because we assume that this won't change on an hourly basis. And then we now expect a job, a JSON web token in our API request, and uh, we'll verify it. Right? So we'll verify this job now, uh, and within that job, we may find the API key. And this is now again the very high API key policy, same as before, but it's not in the header, but it's actually encapsulated within the JSON web token as seen uh, often. So here we see that the API key reference is uh, from a variable. So we see that the JOT variable, the claim within the JOT and the CID, for example, this is where we find the API key. And we're back to basics. Apigee knows who's calling this API it can show you with the nice stats and dashboards that you've seen before. So these six uh, policies essentially have been wrapped up into uh, have been wrapped up into a called shared flow, and have been uh, have been added as a reusable uh, box into this pay later API. Right. And that's essentially all that's required to provide a uh, single identity. Uh, through flows, you can do even more with it. But this is a way to integrate with a third-party identity provider easily and quickly. Uh, because we see customers, their users, 
but also oftentimes applications through an external IDP. And Apigee can definitely integrate with those um, as an example with this capability. Right. So we have our PayLater API. That's number one. Two, we also want to have an identity endpoint because we want to, well, obviously, you know, provision, uh, we want to generate tokens. So uh, good old OAuth and OpenID Connect. We have our get auth endpoint. Um, we have our post endpoint, right? So we have our authorized get. And we have our post token endpoints. We still, as you see here, we still use our Okta auth server stored as a variable, as our you know, single source of truth identity server. But we can use a proxy front to store the tokens and to generate tokens, depending on what's required. Not, 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 not going into much detail here, but essentially, we have an identity proxy that's sitting in front of our external IDP. So we now have identity and our pay later API. And um, the next step that, if you recall from our diagram, is because we've solved identity now, we now want to make uh, these available to different uh, developers. So we've built a product, as you've seen before, and we now can create an instance of a dev portal very easily. You just click plus portal, give it a name, that's it. Uh, saving a bit of time. We have our um, portal now. In this example, we are a bank called Best Bank here, and we have our dev available. We can go into the APIs. So you see here uh, some standard open banking APIs uh, for you know listing ATMs, uh, custom information, as well as our pay later API. Clicking on this one, it opens up the spec. Now, as a developer, I want to sign in, which I can do through here. And I want to build applications because I want to get credentials, right? So I give it a name, three, and I want to use the pay later API only. I hit and as you would expect, we get an API key and a secret, and we now have this app as part of our other apps that have been built. Perfect. So now, uh, as a developer, we can test this application, right? Whether we are a developer persona or a product owner of a fintech, we can now explore this. So let's zoom in a bit. What we want to try out now is uh, how this, um, you know, how, how a loan offer actually works. So for that, we can go into the loan offer endpoint. Uh, we definitely have to give it some consumer ID. We can expect this to be more of a sandbox environment. So we can simply say, all right, we'll have to use OAuth. Oh, let's, uh, let's use these this authentication mechanism to actually understand how can I, as an end user, log in. So as we see, in the back, it's calling the identity endpoint. Um, I can sign in as an end user. And the API docs now retrieve the OAuth token. And I could now start to add um, information into this, uh, into this request body. Just saving a bit of time here. A sample would look as follows. Upfront payment, the purpose of it, the amount, the currency. And once we're ready, we can execute this API. We see that is a response. We have a look into it a bit bigger. We get the loan offer, we get the amount, the validity of the loan, and we get different interest rates and trenches, etc., of these loans. So we get all the information, and developers can easily discover uh, how to uh, how to go about it. Okay. And last but not least, uh, if we move forward again a couple of days and weeks into the future, then you will have partners. Uh, you will have a merchant that signs up on your dev portal and will build a completely new experience uh, using these using the APIs that you provide, right? And as part of that example, I've built an assistant application that is simply acting as a merchant, giving me uh, the latest uh, deals of Pixel books, or you know, can consider them laptops in general, and um, 
allowing me to offer either pay later or pay now to see how the APIs are then used. So for that, just to make this interesting, you know, for, for more the you know, API developers, we'll have a look into the pay later API. Okay, that's fine. So we have our pay later API. We can start a trace to see what's going on. And look at our API uh, proxy just to see what's 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 passing through the platform and how things work in the background. And again, I'll start a trace here. Perfect. So identity is up, pay later is up. What I can do now is I'll bring up my device and I'll go through that flow and we'll see what happens. It's good that at least the only thing that's good is that I can do this from my room at these days because at conferences, running a voice demo is highly dangerous. <laughs> All right. So I have my assistant here, and I'll start the conversation, and you see what's going on there. This is now a merchant. It's using the pay later API and a simplified example of how things can look like. Talk to a Pixelbook deal store. Today. Are there any offerings available? Here you go. Okay, selected the first one, just a selection of products here as an example pixel book. It says that I've selected this one costing £854. Would you like to pay now or pay later? Now I'll select pay later. Okay, now choose the bank you're with. I'll choose Fast Bank because this is where I'm developing, uh, this is what I would like to use, which my bank is. Um, it could be multiple, right? Um, essentially, that means that the merchant, based on the selection of banks, is now sending the pay later API request to the, uh, to the correct uh, endpoint and bank. Now, identity has already been covered already because I've logged in a couple of minutes earlier. We can see from the identity endpoint that uh, we've received the request here for identity slash token. A couple of things, uh, you know, verifying the API key. It simply sent it back, as you see again, to Opta. And that device received the token type bearer. So now what a JOT token, essentially. And then we can get the user info to get a bit of context and say, you know, my name, et cetera, as we see here, name information, it's Now back to uh, back to the pay later API. Oh, I need to blow. Okay, all good. Select one of the low lockers below to confirm. So I've now selected the loan offering, uh, progressed with the overall flow after I've received the uh, information about the, the loan offerings. And essentially it, right? It takes it from there and says, um, depending on the response of the API, the payment can be made directly or uh, it can be handled then separately by email. And it says there, email confirmation or next steps can be done through the next channel. But these are the three API calls that have been made from that device now. So first of all, it was about the consumer consent, essentially uh, asking the client, asking the end user whether there is consent to get a loan offering. Once that was done, uh, the API returned with an ID number that can be used moving forward for any loan offers in the next minutes or days. Then there is the request for a loan offering. So the payment amount, the currency, et cetera. We as a bank return with that uh, information about the loan and the validity, the trenches, and how long they can pay, and the, the different options that we've seen. And once we've confirmed it, there was a payment request. So all the information about uh, the loan, and how it should be paid, and when has been added. And again, a loan payment ID has been sent back that can then be tracked again by the merchant 
to see whether that has already been paid or whether the, the end user, the end client, would like to revoke it. So that three steps we've covered, right? So we went from a legacy loan API with a couple of you know, skipping steps to, to you know, give you the bigger picture, where we ended up having API offering the ability to merchants and end users with the end user context. We've integrated with the third party identity provider easily, and we took that API with its spec and put that on our dev portal. To wrap things up, right, now that you have microservices in the future, you also want to combine API management with service mesh. But because I was expecting this to take exactly three minutes to end, I just want to cover briefly that Apigee also has the capability to integrate with a service mesh or simply with a microservices and more cloud native environment through Envoy. Envoy being a very popular uh, a lightweight gateway that's used, for example, in the Istio service mesh. We have our an, uh, we have the so-called Apigee adapter there that allows you to enforce security and send analytics data to a central API management control plane, but it leaves uh, the enforcement, the gateway runtime in your uh, Kubernetes cluster. Right? So even if you look from legacy modernization over to having both, over to being in a new world of microservices, API management, because it's managing the of APIs, is and stays relevant. To summarize, the benefits of using Apigee and API management to unlock legacy apps is really accelerate time to market. You have existing capabilities. You don't get funding to rebuild them and refactor. You can modernize in place. When migrating, you can avoid business disruption, and you can access legacy modern service seamlessly uh, and equally. You can increase the consumption of your apps securely. Uh, you can measure the adoption into cloud and off your services as well through our analytics. Have a look at our solutions page. There's a bit.ly link below. Uh, you can always sign up for a trial self-service, and you can always get in touch with me or somewhere else from our other team, or go into our virtual booth that we have there as well, where other colleagues are waiting for you for a catch up and chat. From my side, that's everything. Thanks very much. We've just ended up at uh, the end of our 15 minutes workshop. I hope this was insightful to you and have a good rest of the day. Thank you.